She launched a certified B Corporation MT Art Agency back in 2015, following a career in visual arts in London and Los Angeles. With her agency, Marine looks to support, promote, and enable artists to work with the broadest canvas possible. From public art to fine art institutions, Marine is a passionate advocate for the core of the artist and guides the public through a world flooded with visual noise and ensures artists are rightfully recognized and the spokespeople for the visual age. Let's please give her a warm round of applause and thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Maureen Tongi, and as you said, I'm the leading talent agency in the art world. We found it eight years ago. Today, I want us to reflect about the sheer amount of images we're being bombarded daily. From the minute you're literally stepping onto the morning and looking at your phone, up to you, commuting to, to work, you'll be bombarded with imagery. And that will be through retailers, that will be through billboards, that will be digitally. And that imagery ultimately will affect you. And that imagery will be pushing you what we call the visual narrative of success, the aspirational lifestyle, the idea that you have to consume over and over again. And I am sure you're very familiar with it. The University of Warwick, um, led by uh, Professor Andrew Oswald, looked across 900,000 people from 1980 to 2011, and they looked at their exposure, specifically of their imagery, onto their well-being. And I'm, not, I'm sure you won't be surprised that the higher the exposure, the um, unhappier they were becoming. Now, if you put in parallel that 84% of our use is crippled by eco-anxiety, and you put the two side by side, not only is ultimately this consumption visual narrative pushing us to destroy our planets and overtly consume, but it's also making us feel really miserable. Today I'm going to look at how did we get there from an art historical standpoint. Second, ultimately, how is the climate change crisis narrating itself, and how can we ultimately learn to shift it? Maybe you're familiar with these paintings. They were incredibly pop popular from the 15th to the 20th century. They are called Vanitas paintings. And Vanitas painting says it all. That is what you should be acquiring, and you're defined by the objects you acquire. That is your self-worth. That is your status. That is ultimately who you are through those objects. And that is one of the most popular art forms. This started our idea that we could only realize ourselves through the objects that we owned. And we have a pretty similar relationship with nature. So if you look at the paintings of Poussin, we see nature as this pretty fantasy, this pretty backdrop that we must control and own, and ultimately that we desire to be perfect and ideal. And Poussin was painting this perfectly. The problem, as we all know, that's another Poussin that I love, the problem, as we all know, is nature doesn't really behave like a pretty backdrop. And came the 19th century, the Romantic Heroes, with this amazing painting by Caspar David Friedrich. And you saw here the man facing the immensity, the monstrosity of nature. It's too big, and it's much bigger than him. He can't own it, he can't control it, he can't be self-defined by it. And you see another painting called The Shipwreck by Turner. Maybe you would know Turner, he's a British artist of the 19th century as well. And here you have it all, where the, in the 19th century, the Navy was what was most progressive about the British Empire. And yet here, nature just destroyed it in two seconds. And he can't handle it, it's too much. Nature is destroying the lifestyle, the progress, the visual narrative that self-defines us. How do we ultimately find all these elements today when defining the climate change crisis. This polar bear, and I'm so sorry that I have to project this, but this polar bear was the front cover of the Time magazine back in 2006, with a key title said, Be Worried, Be Very Worried. I can't determine my book, Porn Sadness. You're literally, as you're looking at that image, are feeling sick, triggered emotionally, and almost frozen to action. You cannot act because it's so overwhelming. So quickly, when it came to the climate change crisis, media reporters understood that they had to integrate our lifestyle into it. So they had to go back to what we just discussed earlier and to make us feel more directly concerned because being frozen with emotions, all the while you might be shocked, doesn't actually lead to any course of action. 
Maybe you remember this photograph this year from January in California. When we think of California, what's most inspirational about California is that house overlooking the sea with that swimming pool. That swimming pool here is just holding on for his dear life on the top of the cliff as the storm has destroyed all of it. That's a symbol of your Californian dream that's just gone. And what's really interesting as well in terms of the headlines is specifically pick up on the symbol, that symbol again of that strong visual narrative that holds a Californian dream. And I'm sure you can recognize some of the shipwreck of Turner into those images, into the way it's shot. And then again, Florida on the 13th of April this year again, when we think of those cars, you see life less into the water, although you probably can't see that much with the sun today. And you think about how key cars are for the American dreams. In the 1950s, 1960s, you were ultimately defined by the cars that you own, which ultimately meant that if you were to be promoted, if you were to get a new job, you will acquire a new car. And your advertising was really much reinforcing this. You were self-defined by the car you will ultimately drive, and here they are completely lifeless. And you've seen tons of those pictures that went viral because of the shock again it creates. That dynamic between what we earn, what is aspirational, I'm sure on your way to here, you've already been bombarded by loads of images this morning of that aspirational visual narrative, and sustainability always feels back and forth of each other. And I think, there's a social media clash between Greta Thunberg and Andrew Tate, the influencer, that was really interesting to look at for that specific reason. When Greta Thunberg was pushing a more sustainable lifestyle, he kept sending her private, um, photos of private jet ski, or fast cars, or images of him on the private jets. And in his head, he is actually excelling at the visual narrative he's been sold since he's born. In fact, if you flick a magazine right now, Andrew Tate is much more similar to what you're going to be seeing in that magazine than Greta Thunberg. So he's thinking, I've excelled, I've done exactly what visually I was told, and this is what he's sending back at Greta, which I think is a really interesting clash. Um, oops, so sorry. And alongside, to go back to what we had just discussed with Poussin, so sorry, I just lost it, that's it. And to go back to what we just discussed with Poussin, alongside this narrative and this clash between nature and our aspirational lifestyle, we still have a very idealized nature. This image is made out of 2,200 images. It's actually a collage. It's one of the most viral images out of the National Geographic. And actually, this is totally made up. Like, he spends, Stephen Wilkes, the photographer, 26 hours to shoot it. And again, within those 2,200 images, then collage the ideal image that he has of nature. And I'm sure you will, uh, that will remind you of the endless amount of social media posts that we have that are totally idealistic in the same nature, where we overtly idealize nature in the way that we had seen earlier. The problem with all the discourse I showed you today is that whether nature is a threat, whether it's idealized, it's ultimately not, we're not emotionally connecting. Those two are two extremes. We need new visual narratives. And I think art and artists are the perfect candidate to become and to shape that new visual narrative. Once again, as I'm sure you know, art is a key component in supporting our mental health. Art is also able to build common thread and common visual narrative. Let's just say you, instead of all the images you have looked at, you're starting your day with this photograph by Claire Loxton instead. She is retaking the core rhythm and foundation of nature, which is ultimately, you probably can't see very clearly, but as she's crying, you know, the, the blossom of the flowers comes out, which is one of the most basic thing in terms of the seasons of nature. That after grieving will be the same, there is hope. But also, she's connecting as a human being to it. It's not a shock image. That will completely shift your priorities, but also your relationship with mental health, if you were to start your day with an image like this. Same when it comes to this artwork. So you have to imagine it that's about three meters long. This is all made of discarded objects. We just looked at the Vanitas painting. The Vanitas painting told you 
You can only realize yourself through what you acquire, just like the adverse we looked at earlier. Here, this is a total opposite. She's saying we've acquired way too much. The only way to realize ourselves is ultimately on how we're going to make use specifically of the subjects. And again, how different will it be to start your day with an image like this? That will be very difficult to then run to Zara to buy your cheap top very quickly. This is reshaping entirely how you're thinking about the world you live in. Let's take another step back, which is one out of two of us will be living in cities by 2050. In cities, that's what we get most bombarded with, and you probably will have experienced it specifically in the city, where you're constantly bombarded with advertising. And if one out of two of us will be in cities, we are constantly being pushed that specific narrative that's going to get us to want to consume and to ultimately to want to buy endlessly and buy into this lifestyle. So let's say that instead of this amount of commercial imagery, we had art instead, we had public art instead. You could be bypassing literally a park on your way to work, and that's a biodegradable paint um, that our artists did in Utah for the latest David Attenborough documentary. Or you could, again, be cycling past the office, and that's an artwork that our artist Robert Montgomery did with Little Sun. Or again, you could be continuing, and instead of the billboards, let's think of a Piccadilly Circus, or Times Square, you could actually have a reflective surface instead of that billboard. Or an artwork that celebrates queer voices, like the one of Adam Nathaniel Furman. Just as you're looking at it, think how differently your day will be if you were to actually start the day with public art instead of advertising, constant advertising, thousands of imagery. So that's what we need your help. We need your help to push new regulations that will ultimately moderate the amounts of commercial imagery that we get exposed to. We also need your help to prove the, the important role that public art has to play within this dynamic. And finally, therefore, that the role that artists and art plays in redefining and rewriting a visual narrative. And if we do so well, then reality would ultimately look a lot more like the video I'm about to project to you, which is the past year and a half of projects that we've been doing as a company. And I hope you'll prefer that reality like I do too. Thank you so much. journey and stories more than just a picture on the camera.